What is up? Hello to all of you unconventional conventionists out there. Welcome to Rocky Talkie, the show where we talk about anything and everything related to Rocky Horror. I'm Aaron. I am John. And I'm Nikki. How are you guys doing this week? John, what have you been up to? What's been going on in your world? Well, for anyone who is listening who has been under a rock for the past multiple weeks, this past weekend was my birthday. Yay! Birthday boy! I am now 69 years old. Happy birthday, geezer. Thanks, buddy. It was a good day. Uh, I did a 12-hour stream on Twitch. We played a lot of Pokemon Snap. We played uh, some Animal Crossing because you obviously have to watch the Animal Crossing birthday scenes. They're adorable. And we rounded out the day with some Wheel of Fortune because Wheel of Fortune is somehow the funniest game in the world. That sounds so fun. It was fun. I also got the second dose of the Moderna and I had no side effects. I'm immortal. I can kill God. You know, piggybacking off of that, by the time this airs, all three of us will be fully vaccinated. And you know what that means. What does that mean? The next episode, Rocky Talkie will single-handedly kill God. Yeah. Yeah. So look forward to that. If I couldn't do it by myself, imagine all three of us. Oh, yeah. It's done. It's happening. I already put it on the calendar. I'm going to spit in his eye. That'd be a fun cover. Rocky Horror Kills God. I could Photoshop that. That'd be fun. Yep. What about you, Nikki? What'd you do this past week? Well, you know, I'd sectioned out a very heavy part of my week to celebrating your birthday because it's an all week event. Correct. But on my off time, you know, when I wasn't praying to my John shrine, I was able to vend at the Trenton Punk Rock Flea Market, which was a lot of fun. We got to sell a lot of stuff and see a lot of people from six feet away. And I saw my tattoo artist, and she didn't recognize me, but that's okay. But I had a really good time. I'm really enjoying myself. It's getting warmer in New Jersey, and I can't be happier because I love the heat, and I hate the cold, and life is good. Speaking of life being good, you guys know what I did this week? No, I don't. I have no idea. Oh, I got I got those sweet, sweet taxes done. Yep. That's right. You just got them done? You You just did your taxes? Listen, some of us had uh, some outstanding legal obligations that had to be reconciled before. (laughs) No, I'm just kidding. Uh, I I put it off. I put it off like a little little lazy bastard. Uh, Finally got them all done. Uh, Realized a little bit too late that if I had committed tax fraud, I could have saved another $10,000. But, Ah. you know, that didn't seem like a great option this year, so I elected not to. And got a couple thousand dollar return, which, you know what? That all works out great. So, you know. Hell yeah. Gonna be putting that to some good use on a Frank jacket or other Brocky merch. I I don't know. I have nothing else to spend my money on. There's nothing to go do. Soon. Very soon. But I think that's enough about us. Let's move it along to our first segment. Global News. burped too at the same time oh my gosh we're Kindred so insane honestly so first stop in global news this past week our favorite activist susan sarandon protested the start of steven donziger's new york city trial i'm sorry whose trial steven donziger he was a former attorney who went high profile after he successfully prosecuted Chevron for polluting indigenous areas of Ecuador. So back in 2011, Stephen was awarded $18 billion from an Ecuadorian court. Yeah. And it was reduced down to $9.5 billion in 2011, which sounds like a lot, but it's less than one-tenth of what Chevron makes any single year. The legal situation behind it actually got really messy. Chevron refused to pay, and then they instead filed a racketeering suit against Stephen. In 2014, a New York federal court determined that the judgment in Ecuador was obtained by corrupt means. So now, Stephen is appealing the New York ruling, but he's also facing contempt charges for alleged misconduct during the appeals process. If he's found guilty, Stephen could face up to five months, wow, in prison, as well as having his entire legal battle with the big, bad oil tycoons upended. Stephen believes that Chevron's ultimate goal here is to try and scare people away from bringing similar lawsuits in the future against companies like theirs. 
Okay, so here's what's fucked up about this. Now, obvious disclaimer, I'm not a lawyer. I don't have any of the necessary background to properly analyze this, but I can critically read Wikipedia. So here's what I think's going on here that makes this particularly fucked up. Donzinger had this judgment ruled on in Ecuador, case closed, done in an Ecuadorian court, comes back to New York and is charged by Chevron for actions in another country's court system. And then the judge who ruled on that insists that he be tried for criminal charges that the New York State District Attorney does not want to file against him. Chevron wants them filed against him. So what do they do? They let a U.S. company determine that a lawyer who had a judgment ruled against them can arbitrarily have criminal charges brought up against them, not because the government wants to, but because a company wants to. That's fucked up. I don't like that at all. And it's super fucked up because Stephen has suffered major personal loss from this legal battle. Back in 2018, he was disbarred from practicing law and has been under house arrest since August of 2019 to await trial, as the presiding judge thought his ties to Ecuador made him a flight risk. Stephen has summed up his views for us, stating, Oil and big fossil fuel companies do not want to pay for their pollution. If they have to, then their entire business model would be much less viable or would have to be extinguished. They hate the concept of a country like Ecuador having a court that holds a big U.S. company accountable. I don't think they want other countries ruling on the conduct of the U.S. companies to this degree. Yikes. Uh, he sounds like he's got a pretty good point there. I mean, it's their country that's being polluted. But wait, where does Susan Sarandon come into all this? Susan is pissed, of course, and she's not the only one. In fact, Stephen's case has attracted the attention and support of 55 Nobel laureates, over 200 attorneys, and six Democratic members of Congress, including Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, Rashida Tlaib, and Jamie Raskin. Stephen's trial kicked off Monday, May 10th, and is currently still underway. That morning, the protest, which was led by Susan Sarandon, Pink Floyd's Roger Waters, as well as several dozen others, took place outside the courthouse. Some participants were wearing masks that said, Free Donziger. Others carried signs, you know, standard stuff. Susan and Roger were even granted entry to the courtroom to spectate as the trial started and opening statements were given. This is such an interesting case, and while it is only tangentially related to our usual content because of how invested Susan is, we're very excited to keep you all updated as it unfolds. We here at Rocky Talkie would like to give a humongous round of applause to Susan, as well as the other protesters for standing up for what they believe in and taking the time to bring attention to such an important cause. But enough barely Rocky content, let's kick it on over to some real Rocky content in... A community news. La da 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 da. Hey, depending on how you look at it, this is also barely rocky content. Am I right? <laughs> yes. Because because they're bare. Cause they're naked. Yeah, they're naked. Ha <laughs> ha, naked. <laughs> they're naked. Ew. Just wow. Kidding, they're probably great. Speaking of naked, we've got lots of exciting stuff in community news this week. First up, spoiler, you might have already figured this one out. Have you guys ever wanted to perform Rocky without costumes? Eh? Every week. <laughs> I mean, sure, who hasn't? Getting into costume can be such a pain when you're just not feeling it. It would be a million times easier some nights to just say fuck it and go on stage in jammies. I'd like to reiterate my ultimate theme night idea. It was the first thing that I ever brought to NYC and we still never did it because everyone thought it was stupid. But... It's not, and I don't care what anybody says, casual Friday. It's a Friday night show, and all of us still show up with, like, full face and makeup for the character that we're playing, but we just wear whatever the fuck we want. It's casual. Frank just comes on stage in, like, ripped up jeans and a band t-shirt for Sweet Tea and throws off his leather jacket instead of a cape. It would be amazing. Everyone else is wrong if they think otherwise. No, actually, ironically, back in like 
March, like two Marches ago, pre-pandemic, when coronavirus started becoming a big conversation piece and people started to get nervous. Our theater was still running, obviously. There wasn't even a mask mandate yet. And a lot of the cast members, including myself, got nervous about the whole thing. So we called out of our Friday show because we didn't want to go. And that was like, that was the last show. And instead of wearing costumes, the, the remaining cast members literally just wore their normal clothes. And one of them put on like a Janet like jacket and they held the bouquet and they did the whole show and like they pulled audience members on and they said that it was like an excellent time guys no i i'm not talking about lazy costumes i don't feel like you're getting it without costumes oh oh yeah you know what seven i do this thing with the pink frank lab scene gloves like the dinner scene party hat with champagne bottle it's not really performing but we're pretty good about staying in character Tell me more. Tell me less. Like, does he have a car? <laughs> <laughs> no, Jesus Christ, guys. It serves me right for trying to be cute. So anyway, we're talking about Rocky in the flesh. This is the longest running all nude Rocky cast. And they're returning to the outdoor stage in Lander Lakes, Florida on July 19th, 2021 at 9 p.m. Like the butter? Yes, Lander Lakes, like the butter. <laughs> so there isn't much info about this show yet, but the info we do have is pretty clutch. So for this performance, the cast will be using a real pool and body paint costumes for floor show. Plus, there'll be access to camping, pool tables, a hot tub, and a foam pit. This entire event is BYOB, and by the way, tickets to this rager are only 20 bucks. Plus, the show is immediately followed by a naked alien foam party, which Tickets to Rocky grants you access to. Um, I'm so sorry to stop you, but a naked alien foam party? Wait, wait, hold on. <clears throat> hold on, guys. I'm going to try the thing. Bear with me. Bear with me, okay? Sure would be nice to have a foam pit at RKO4, Roy. All right, it's out there. I've done my good deed for the day. Well, this sounds like such a fucking blast and honestly, a super fun way to kick off Hot Girl Summer that we're all about to have now that so many of us are vaccinated. That said, there's no word yet on what the regulations on the event are going to be regarding the requirements for the vaccinations. Probably not a lot of social distancing going on in the foam pit, so hopefully they'll require all guests to show their shots card at the door, but it's Florida, so who the fuck knows. Holy crap, though. If any of our Florida listeners go to this one, please, 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 for the love of God, <laughs> write to us and tell us about it. All the links for the event are in our show notes. Actually, it doesn't even have to be this event. If any of our listeners have been to a naked foam pit, give us the deets. Uh, Nikki, maybe don't hold your breath on that one. What someone does in a naked foam pit is between them god and the other 43 people in the pit uh, we do have more exciting community news coming right up though go to your room and lock the door because when you try it once you want to try it some more size doesn't matter and that's a fact it might be small but it's a big impact Ooh. bust a nut bust a nut grab a bag of corn nuts and bust a nut Corn Nuts, an intensely crunchy corn snack, comes in seven nut-busting flavors. It sounds like there should be a commercial there, but there's not. So, moving over to <laughs> FFO. Our friends over at Frankie's Favorite Obsession cast, that's out of Las Vegas, are just about ready to return to the stage. On Saturday, July 3rd at 10 p.m., FFO will be performing at the Regency Tropicana Cinemas. FFO made their triumphant return announcement on social media this week. It's always so much fun to see posts like this. It really feels like the world is starting to heal, you know? Absolutely. And this isn't just any triumphant return show after being dark for over a year. Not at all. This is a major two-for-one celebration because Sunday, July 4th, is FFO's 20th anniversary. 
So not only will the cast be celebrating being back on stage, they're also throwing themselves a dope ass birthday party. If you're going to be in the Las Vegas area and you are interested in joining in on the celebration, we've got links for you in our show notes. Tickets are only $11 at the door with an online purchase option that is coming soon. Plus, we know that FFO is being super safe about their reopening. If the CDC's mask mandate is still in effect at showtime, they will be requiring all patrons to be masked throughout the performance. They're also very strongly encouraging that only fully vaccinated people plan to attend. Get your shots, people! Another fun little tidbit from FFO, they're also recruiting new cast members. So if you live in the Las Vegas area and are interested in joining a Rocky cast, they've got a Google Form application open to the public. We'll link it for you in our notes if you're interested in checking it out. Last up, we just want to remind all of our listeners to tune in to the Francis Bacon Experiments virtual performance, which will be airing on Friday, May 21st at 9 p.m. on rhpslive.com. That's tomorrow if you're tuning in on the day our show drops. So this is a pre-taped and highly edited performance of a Dark Alley drive-in show that was put on to give Buffalonians a safe entertainment option during the pandemic. We've already gotten to see a little bit of the footage from the show, and it looks like it's going to make for excellent virtual entertainment. The cast is super hot, and they all look like they're having a great time performing. It's going to be tons of fun. I cannot wait to watch. We'll all be tuning in to shout virtual callbacks and throw digital props with the cast, so we hope that you'll join us. If you'd like to, we've got a link to the event for you in our show notes. And with that, let's move on to the nickiest segment of all. That's me! That's right, boys and girls. It's time for Nikki Asks a Question. Featuring me, Nikki. Nope. What? I said nope. It's my birthday. There is no knack snack today. I'm special today. Fuck you. Hi, special today. I'm... I will cut you. Oh my gosh. Okay, well, John, what do you want to do for your birthday? There's a lot of things that I want to do for my birthday, Nikki. But today... Today is a special treat. You might not know, but I am what might be known as a 90s kid. Hell yeah! Me too! How is that possible? Aaron is old as dirt, and John is just barely geriatric. You can't both be 90s kids. Nikki, and 90s kids range from anyone born in the early 80s all the way through to the mid-90s. You could be on either side of the decade. You could be a teen in the 90s, or, or a tween, or a, or a pre-tween, whatever, whatever that is. A twaddle. A twat? <laughs> a kid? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, that last one. It's a kid. Okay, fine. You're a 90s kid. And? Well, I want to do what all 90s kids do now. I want to make a listicle with a super clickbaity title. Here's the five most important Rocky moments from the early 90s. Only five? We'll, we'll do it VH1, like I love the 90s style. We can just merge a bunch of shit together. It, it, it's fine. Don't worry about it. But only after 1992. The world didn't really exist until around 1992. You were born in 1992. Yes. The world began existing in 1992. Uh, 1992. I was six. And the world popped into existence because a small, bald child named John was born in a manger in Bethlehadelphia. You see, there was no room at the Holiday Inn Express, and though they had left the light on for us, our reservations had been at the Days Inn down the road. Ah, this is my favorite part. No, no. Rocky, stop it. Save the conspiracy theories for your stupid podcast or whatever. Okay, Nikki. 1992, uh, that's the 17th anniversary of Rocky Horror, and the community is still recovering from the mm, communal hangover from the 15th anniversary in 1990. You can uh, finally get your hands on the VHS. For a cool $89.95. That's 33.3333333 repeating Frank Jackets. 
and Sal Piero's first Creatures of the Night book is released. I said no Bible stories. Okay, and Rocky is still playing all over the country. The community is as big as ever, having made it out of the bodacious 80s and into the bomb 90s. You are not cool. Eat my shorts. <laughs> and then I was born, and then the world began. And five months later, after the world began, in October, the UK Time Warp Fan Club hosts their first Rocky Horror Convention. That's Transylvanian 92, and that was organized by Stephanie Freeman and her husband David. Who eagle-eared listeners might remember from the Striped Shirt Mystery. That's right. And the couple organized the massive event in London with over 600 guests from all over the world. There were events and appearances from the stars, a packed panel schedule, and even a special appearance from that guy from the Taster's Choice commercials. You know that coffee? Anthony Head? 90s kids might know him as that hot guy with glasses on Buffy. Uh, sure, la later though. His, his first Frank was in 1990. Whatever. Giles can taste my choice anytime he... We, we get it. We get it, Nikki. It sounds like an awesome event. Anne was all for charity, with the proceeds going to London's Great Ormond Hospital, which specialized in dealing with children with AIDS. A pretty great cause, and a great Rocky Con. Also, one of the first appearances of Richard O'Brien's Mephistopheles Smith character, which he donned to play a smattering of new songs to a full house. Uh, did somebody say full house? Jupiter Papado. Yeah. Yeah, there it is. Full House. So, 1992 also saw the release of a new Rocky Horror calendar. Mm. Yeah, it was themed around the year of the floor show. And I got to tell you, the floor show photos were beyond useful to the community for costume references, as well as looking pretty fly. Pretty fly for a white guy. 1998. By the offspring. And 1992 was also the year that Sal Piero stepped down as cast director of the New York City cast. One winter's evening after one too many run-ins with abusive theater employees and Sal himself officially too old for this shit, he lamented in Creatures of the Night 2 that he was already in his late 40s at that point. So your time is soon, John. Over my sexy rotting corpse. And that's 1992. But as John begins to come into his power at the start of 1993, a freak blizzard rocks the eastern United States. Dubbed the No Name Storm, it cut an icy trail from Honduras to Canada, dropping over 56 inches of snow in Tennessee, with even the Florida panhandle seeing ice and snow. But that won't stop intrepid Rocky folks. In late April, Washington, D.C. hosts a mini convention organized by a non-Rocky fan, John Kane, who only put together this convention as a gift to his daughter, Janelle. Fuck this. Hi, Dad. <laughs> Can I be daughter? I'm baby. Gotta love me. Are you a dinosaur? Yes. Okay. Yes, and I can do whatever I want. I, I appreciate that you don't even get the joke you just did. I have no idea what the fuck's going on. boop be doop be doop boop sex That's not a 90s joke. What's a 90s joke? <laughs> wow! Oh, okay, you ruined community. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. But if you think one Rocky Horror Convention is enough for a year, boy, does 1993 have a lot in store. In August, you had the Age of Consent Convention thrown by Midnight Insanity out of Long Beach. And then in October, just seven weeks after the bash in California, Megan Harris ran the 18th anniversary convention in Las Vegas. Three cons on two coasts in just over six months. One-year-old John would have rocked that shit. I would have been bribing some congressman in D.C. before heading over to the party in L.A. That's right. Rocky's legal. Give me that sweet consent. Then I would have kicked it in Vegas, rocking my diaper at the craps tables, all while hitting my appropriate developmental milestones and getting into a sitting position without fucking help. This is a really weird way to do a decade recap. This is what happens when I'm left to my own devices to come up with topics for Nikki asks a question. So, one-year-old John is passed out after partying too hard all year long. Are we ready for 1994? Hell no! 
1993 is also the year that Rocky first premieres on television, and this one's pretty huge. At the 18th anniversary in Las Vegas, one-year-old John would have heard Sal Piero invite the crowd to come up to L.A. for the filming of the television special. He had worked with Lou Adler and Midnight Insanity to organize a show that would feature fans from all over the country. The special was shot over 12 plus hours, the content being filmed at the Tower Theater in downtown L.A. Rocky was shown and performed twice, with the cast and audience members then rushing to their local shows to perform for the third time in the same day. How did they show Rocky with AP on network TV in 1993? One-year-old John might have been mature enough for all that cursing, but I don't know if the rest of the world was ready for it. In a surprise to absolutely fucking no one, at the last minute, the broadcast execs decided to eliminate many of the callbacks. And then a bunch of the vulgarities had to be cut, which in turn led to a lot more of the audience participation getting cut. Because the jokes make no sense if you have to bleep every word. But some of the fucking jokes were still there, and it aired in October around Halloween, uh, as you do with Rocky stuff, and resulted in, you gotta say, a pretty big kick in attendance around the country. 1993 also saw the birth of the Rocky Horror News Group, alt.cultmovies.rockyhorror, where the majority of the online community argued and shitposted throughout the rest of the 90s. One-year-old John likes a good shitpost, just as much as all grown up John. In that regard, the network premiere kind of settled the hot-button shitpost topic from the tail end of the 80s. Rocky did not die because it was finally released on home video in 1990 and everyone could watch it at home. And it didn't die because it became too mainstream when it was shown on network TV in 1993. In fact, just the opposite. That next year, in 1994, Rocky was even the first movie ever shown on the FX Movie Channel, which also had a tie-in with the New York City cast, with Madman Mike, Sal Piero, and other members of the New York cast appearing on the 6.30 a.m. FX Breakfast Show, teaching 25 first graders how to do the time warp. I mean, two-year-old John dances like a machine, but six-year-olds doing pelvic thrusts? That gets a red flag from me, bruh. Yeah, 1994 also saw the second UK convention, again hosted by the UK fan club and Stephanie Freeman, and in March, a convention was put on in Albany, that's in New York, by a little-known SUNY College Phi Kappa Sigma student named Larry Vizel. Never heard of him. Also, in 1994, the Rocky Horror Stage Show celebrated its 21st birthday with a star-studded party at the Duke of York's Theatre in London, and saw CD releases of both the Shock Treatment album and the Audience Participation soundtrack. Teaching a whole new generation of Rocky fans a bunch of outdated jokes. Remind me, who is Ann Miller again? Uh, Ann Miller didn't actually die until 2004. She had been on an episode of Home Improvement just a year earlier in 1993. So, 90s kids uh, still had no idea who she was. I, I knew she was a tap dancer, but, like, that was it. I think this was my favorite when we were flipping through these. 1994 also saw the establishment of a world record for the most continuous performances of the Rocky Horror Picture Show. The absent friends out of Sacramento, assisted by several other Northern California casts, successfully performed 30 back-to-back -back shows, starting on Friday, October 14th, and ending on Monday the 17th. These shows were crazy. Apparently, they'd set up tents and a camp-style kitchen behind the theater, and the whole thing was covered by the media. I'm amazed that two-year-old John can remember it so vividly. What could I say? I'm a prodigy. Firestarter by Prodigy, March 1996. All right, 1995, John turns three. I could speak 250 to 500 words, and I could count. How high could you count? High enough to know when someone else had more cookies than I did. Then I'd have to smack a bitch up. Released by Prodigy in 1997. In 2010, the song was voted as the most controversial of all time. Well, that's just stupid. Stupid like a fox. You're not wrong. In 1995, Fox went crazy with Rocky's 20th anniversary. And you know what that means? That means a new ultra-expensive box set. This time, we've got a $125 Laserdisc box set, which finally featured Once in a While and Superheroes, along with being bundled with a 24-karat gold CD of the soundtrack 
and the Sal Piro book, Creatures of the Night 2. Gotta get the bling on. The 20th wasn't a massive convention. It was mostly performance and costume contests. But there was a two-day event held at the Roxy and Pantages Theaters in Hollywood. Seems a little weird to not have a big convention for the 20th. I mean, that's only because there had already been three events that year. In February, Megan Harris Tabor threw RockyCon 95 in Beverly Hills. And on the opposite coast, Larry Vizel threw his second big Albany convention in April. September saw a Boston convention put on by Karen Majors and the Tesseract players. And that was all before the two-day event for the 20th anniversary held in October. And... A fun personal note, that October would have been the first time that a nine-year-old Aaron would get a glimpse of Rocky Horror. That's because it finally aired on VH1, along with a special hosted by Meatloaf. It, it wasn't until five years later, with VH1's huge collection of specials, behind the music, and pop-up videos for the 25th, that I really became, like, aware of it. But I do remember seeing parts of Rocky the first time it aired in 1995. Another fun personal note, 1995 October, both my parents turned 16. Anyway, um, 1995 is also when Creatures of the Night 2 was published, along with a karaoke CD and a fan tribute album. That fan tribute album is, um, uh, well, it's got, it's good intentioned, but I mean, if I had to pick one of those two to listen to, I'd probably pick the karaoke album. <laughs> Yikes. Yeah, I, I think that's where we're going to leave it for today. We got all the way through the mid-90s. John is three years old. I could poop all by myself. <laughs> yes, good job. So we'll pick up from there, I don't know, next time John has a birthday. I, I'm sure we might have missed a bunch of stuff, but I mean, we did hit a, a lot. Yeah, that's crazy. Something like 10 conventions over just a couple of years. A few huge milestones and a bunch of big, crazy events. John might have been three years old, but Rocky was definitely partying as hard as ever. Maybe we'll do one of these again. I like it. Wait, are we stopping in 1995 because Creatures of the Night 2 came out in 1995? Is that just as far as the book goes? Shut up. There's, there's other books to tell us what happened after 1995. Sure there are, buddy. You're three. You're a baby. You can't read. Shut up. Make me, poopy head. <gasps> and that's our show <laughs> we want to wish FFO and Rocky in the Flesh all the broken legs as they return to the stage and please don't forget to tune into the Francis Bacon Experiments virtual show it's going to be awesome if you've got a question that you'd like us to answer on air for Nikki Asks a Question or some community news you'd like us to talk about or even just a cool story to showcase your magnum dong to the entire community, we'd love to include it on our show. Just go to our website, rockytalkypodcast.com and fill out our contact form to share with us. We all really love getting to hear about the cool shit you guys have been working on and we love getting to share your work with the whole community. Plus, if your cast is working on something fun, a virtual show, or maybe even a real life show, send that in too, and we will help you spread the word. If you're enjoying Rocky Talkie, please help us by rating, reviewing, and subscribing to the show. It makes the podcast more accessible to new listeners, which really helps us grow the show. And if you want even more Rocky Talkie content, check us out on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok, all at Rocky Talkie Podcast. We'll see you next Thursday. <laughs> <laughs> spells a bad word bye oh i get it <laughs> bye yeah. guys we did that last week john listen to the podcast no don't tell me what to do i'm an adult or three depending on which timeline we're talking in oh con i get i get i get it Of, I can't even try to pronounce that. What the fuck? Nobel laureates. Nobel laureates? Mm hmm. People be a who receive the Nobel Prize. Okay. D thought, Disciples of Chuck Lorre. I thought that said <laughs> Okay. I blew out my voice yelling at Roy. Okay. <clears throat> Highly edited performance of a dark alley drive in show that was put on to give Buffalonians a safe entertainment option during the pandemic. <sighs> <clears throat> Jubide Bop Bow Wow. <laughs> <laughs> mm.
No. I don't know how the end of the Full House theme goes because I never watched it as a kid. I was a friend's person. What if only there was a link to a YouTube video where you could find out. Oh, yeah, yeah there is. The there. <laughs> Even on TV. I like mine better. Uh, we right, might just use yours. But... Just Hold on, I have a... Uh, uh, Everywhere you look. There's a heart. A hand to hold on to. I'm sorry. I'm going crazy. No, it's fine. You're going to get there before he does. So. <laughs> Jubity bop bow wow. Thank you. I am not a 90s kid. Boppy dop be doop boop. <laughs> Sex. That's Go not a 90s video. joke. <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> Go watch the video, Nikki. I even timestamped that one. Okay. Oh, you guys are really teaching me a lesson about writing when I'm high. Get your package out and try to stay calm. Use a few fingers, put them in your palm. Yes, it's gonna be so great when you finally masticate. Bust a nut, bust a nut. Grab a bag of corn nuts and bust a nut They're lightly toasted and hard as hell Enjoy yourself, we won't tell Masticate, masticate Is what you have to do Masticate and masticate Is a fancy word for chew Bust a nut, bust a nut Grab a bag of corn nuts and bust a nut They're lightly toasted and hard as hell Enjoy yourself, we won't tell Bust a nut, 